Nobody likes being around a tense dude. <laughs> it's not healthy. It needs to go. You know, my kids have seen it and my family and you got to work on it and make peace with your past. Hello, and welcome to the Rise Again podcast. My name is Dr. Peter Reisenden. My passion is people, harnessing their potential and the positive impact that that makes on our world. On this podcast, I interview guests who share their journey of tapping into their resilience, strength, fortitude, and mental toughness required to rise from the ashes and live a fulfilling life. My purpose became very clear to me after I experienced a traumatic brain injury and a near-death experience in 2010. Months after that accident, I embarked on a bicycle journey from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. 4,400 miles over 55 days across the United States and Canada, from Washington State to Maine, in a quest that started me on my path doing what I love. To be surrounded by God's created nature and the people He created to give me insight on my quest to live my best life and help others create that for themselves. I believe we all grow tremendously through our adventures and misadventures. My ventures in hormone optimization, integrative medicine, counseling, my own marriage, and the fostering and adoption of my beautiful son have allowed me to create a different future, untethered from my past, allowing me to live the life I've always wanted, to pursue what matters, and more importantly, to help others do the same by working with them to create a resilient mind and body, as well as a purpose-filled spirit needed to live a life of thriving. Welcome to the journey. It's time to rise again. If any of these guests speak to you, do the next best thing and reach out to them. Each guest has a wisdom that only they can have from their own unique experience. Your journey awaits. Let's get going and start taking that next step together. Through the work I do as a medical director of a men's health and hormone optimization clinic in Arizona, as well as the medical director for a nonprofit catering to providing the best of integrative care to military veterans, foster and adoptive families, people experiencing low and fixed income, and health professional students in training, I love what I do. I hope you guys enjoy this podcast. Let's all do the work and follow the steps to rise again. Welcome back, everybody, to the 82nd episode of the Rise Again podcast. So excited to share Bill Murphy with everybody. Growing up in a toxic and abusive home environment, Bill Murphy was constantly overwhelmed by fear and doubt. Nevertheless, he was motivated to show those around him that he could accomplish what he set out to do, in spite of being verbally and physically knocked down. Bill believes that when the storm hits, you have three choices. You give up and become a victim. You can do what you can to survive. Or three, you can learn to thrive. You don't need to have exceptional talents or resources to overcome adversity, be resilient, and achieve extraordinary goals. You are more capable than you realize. You can learn to thrive. Bill is proof. Bill will be the first to tell you he's nothing special, but he's been able to overcome an abusive childhood, post-traumatic stress, mental health challenges, and unexpected crises, all to finish an Ironman, earn a black belt in Krav Maga, and run the Boston Marathon five times, including one on crutches. He's a regular guy who's now thriving at the top of his profession too. Through his debut release, Thriving in the Storm, he seeks to explain how anyone can achieve similar success. Outside of writing, Bill is a nationally recognized mortgage originator who has closed over one and a half billion, with a B, dollars in loans and a top producer for 25 years. He's raised over $500,000 for the Make-A-Wish Foundation and actively supports a number of charities, including Fairway Cares, the American Warrior Initiative, and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He's the founder of the nonprofit Thrive Foundation. You guys are going to really enjoy the topics and the things that we discussed today in the podcast. You know, Bill is just an exceptional person. He's overcome so much. He's really started on his new journey here after writing this book. You know, really, it's just really such a special spot to be where you can impact so many people so deeply. And um, today, Bill and I hope you guys enjoy our podcast together. And you know what? If you really love this, please reach out to Bill, send him a message, let him know how great he is, get on his Facebook, leave him a message, or go on the website, even better yet, and purchase Thriving in the Storm, read his book, and take some action steps or something for us to learn in everything we read, right? So I hope you guys really enjoy today's podcast with Bill Murphy. 
Man, Bill, it's great to have you on and we'll just get kicked off. I mean, it's just really exciting to have you on the podcast. You know, when I got that email from Dan, I was just fired up about, you know, I got your speaker one sheet. I'm reading about you, even got into the book on Amazon, on Kindle a little ways. And I was really excited about reading that. And you have gone through a lot in your life. You have certainly come out the other side. You know, you're at the pinnacle of whatever your profession right now. You've done a lot of academic feats. You know, here you are, I read your story and I'm like, my goodness, some people, it's neat that you wrote a book about it, Thriving in the Storm, because for me, I'm like, when someone goes through all that you've been through to come out the other side, it's, there's lessons that we all can take from that. Thank you. It was the uh, vulnerable piece that I never had for about 48 years of my life that I've tapped into. I was reading the book and, you know, it just kind of gives you goosebumps reading it because it takes you back to some of the, the traumatic stuff that happened in your life as a kid. This is stuff that people wouldn't know about you, right? I mean, it's like you are such a success in the worlds that you live in and all the different things that you've done. I think it's always good to kind of start off with where you grew up and what life was like growing up for you. I grew up in Central Mass, a, a city called Worcester. Not a lot of people know Worcester is the second largest city in New England outside of Boston. Um, if you look at it, uh, you're going to say, a lot of people say Worcester. It's W-R-C-E-S-T-R. Pretty proud of the upbringing in, in, in Central Mass there in Worcester. Wu Town, we call it. And yeah, it was a lower middle class, but we were sprinkled in with some of my friends that, you know, was a neighborhood that would be upper middle class, middle class, lower middle class, but just tighten it, right? And the piece where that I shared in the book was really something that would be taboo. And almost it was embarrassing to even talk about. And I didn't even know it was really not normal to go through the things that I went through growing up. I just thought it was I was dealt a kind of a bad hand with my upbringing and how it was treated and belittled and degraded and just made to feel less than my whole life and the the physical beatdowns and and things of that nature. I didn't even really remember a lot of it until recently. I just knew that I wanted to always succeed no matter what, in spite of how it was made to feel. It's not natural to feel that way because if you're a kid, you want to cower, you want to cave, you want to give in. You want to be nurtured. And I think what saved me was my attitude to go out and show them, show that I can overcome and be resilient. That's where this came from because I was made to feel less than. To give you you a couple of examples, growing up in our household, everything was conditional. My mom was very loving, unconditional. On the other side of that is it wasn't from my dad, my dad. And there's no, and I'm not knocking anybody, but, you know, he he was 19 years old. He was a guy's guy and he couldn't play as much as he wanted to with his friends, 19 years old. Right. And, you know, he had me at 19 and my sister at 20 and we started a family. And I really believe when I look back on how he treated me and us was resentment. He resented us, resenting having children at such a young age where he couldn't do as much as he wanted to do and maybe was financially strapped. And I don't blame him there, but the conditions were, we were now his servants to do all these chores, to get things done around the house. You know, children should be seen and not heard. It was, you know, I'm the boss. These are my rules. If you don't like it, you can leave. Like it was just a living cliche of just dictatorship. And I just would be out of the house as much as I could. No one I was going to get punished. No one I was going to get beat down. And if I didn't come home, I, I just stayed out later just saying, because you know what? The beat down is going to be just as bad no matter what I do. So why go home? I miss the streetlights coming on. I'm already going to get choked out. I mean, so I'll just go home a couple hours later. It's not going to really make too much of a difference. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how I grew up at a young age to be thinking about succeeding. It was like you had the means to to help your kids, you know, with clothing and all, and their necessities, survival necessities. And, you know, he would insist that, you know, my mom would go to the Salvation Army to get clothes for us. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing where that matters is you can do that and that's okay. But when you do that and then you, you go out on guys trips to go on a weekend fishing trip, or, you know, and stay somewhere or you go on a hunting trip and you do all these things that, you know, are kind of luxurious, then that becomes hypocritical. These are all things that I see in hindsight. 
I decided I'm going to get a paper route because I was getting bullied when I was showing up with jeans that didn't fit me or funny brands or sneakers or whatever. And, and I was like, no way. I need a pair of Nikes and I need a pair of Levi's. And that's where we grew up and we're not going to have no name stuff. And again, this is not, I'm not trying to be pretentious here. I'm just trying to say that, you know, kids can be mean about things. You know, I wasn't going to take it. So that's how that started where we're going to thrive no matter what, in spite of, you know, being made to feel less than. Like you said, kids are are mean at some point. You know, there's kids who will be mean, right? And as a kid, I mean, you're, you know, you're you're just surviving kind of at home, even though you're kind of fighting back a little bit, right? You know, I, I caught in the book, you know, the little lip that you'd give back to, you know, your dad or whatever else when things would happen at home and you'd kind of go do your own thing anyways. But as far as, you know, you're surviving at home and then it's like, well, I want to do more and I want to, I want to survive out there too and thrive out there. And so then, yeah, you get your own paper route and buy your own Levi's and Nikes. And that's where you got started as a hustler. You know that, right? This is where you, I see this in you. I'm like, you've done so much in your life and you would never settle for less than anything else. I don't know. I see this and, and I see what you've done with your life. And it's like, you've always just made it work and you've always put things together. Yeah, I mean, it didn't stop at the paper routes. It was the go cut the grasses of the neighbors who had lawns that needed it or or rake leaves or shovel snow. I mean, Massachusetts, that's what we had. We had the four seasons. So, you know, there was all those side hustles and it got me out of the house. And I was, a, I mean, I love my sports too. I mean, it was, that was also my vice. You know, I would just love my baseball, football. You know, my pond hockey, you know, we're right off a, a, a lake. And so it was it was really nice to just get out of the house as much as we possibly could, you know, have those side hustles. And I was kind of, I was paying my own room and board. <laughs> right. That's what it sounds like. Like you said, we don't blame our parents for anything they did, right? They were so young. We look back, it's like, okay, there's some things where, you know, there's some responsibility can be taken, right? As adults, we can go, okay, there should have been some responsibility there or whatever. But I was just thinking about that the other day. I was like, my dad had me when he was, and I was like, oh my goodness. And I've got my own little boy now, right? It puts it all into perspective. You kind of go back and you're like, okay, some people were just not in a, and my dad was in a good spot, I feel like, as far as raising us kids, interestingly enough. I mean, but but you see the shortcomings that everybody has and you're like, it's interesting. I tend to little, we both, it sounds like, tend to give a little bit of grace to like, okay, yep, their age, they were young, whatever else. But like you said, as a kid, you don't really realize it. You're just kind of growing up in a dysfunctional household and you're like, well, I'm not going to be dysfunctional. Like I'm going to show the world that, you know, I'm normal Bill. I have a good life. And and here you were. Did anybody know what was going on at your home? No, it's pretty funny now that I did write the book and I, I never talked about it. Again, it's taboo, right? You don't you don't talk about that stuff. Boys don't cry, men don't cry. You know, if you do, you're soft, you're a baby. There's other choice words that we we used. You know, I've completely turned around into the vulnerability because I think it needs to be shared because so many men and so many people, I mean, it feels like it's it's okay for you know women to talk about you know, what they grew up with and how life may have been tough. But if a guy does, man, he wasn't all right. He was, he was pretty weak. You know, he wasn't very tough. It's still hard to, to even talk about it now. It does feel a little bit embarrassing, but it's so important. You know, I still see some of my, my friends that went through some tough times and tough things, and they could have went down the path that I chose and expressed it positively, but instead it went down the wrong path. Some of them are dead or in jail or in still on the same bar they were 30 years ago. And, you know, have I misstepped? A lot, a lot. And misstepped in relationships, misstepped, you know, I continue to misstep. I misstep with my kids. So I want to just get better every day and be coachable and learn to make an impact. It's time to do that. And when you do have trauma, it's so easy to get into drugs and alcohol and vices and addictions and violence and I mean, I'm, I have a master's in constant psychology. So, and I've worked in the juvenile lockup and, and you see not only, but the gangbangers, murderers and, and, but you see the, the child abusers too. And because of, they were a product of their environment as well. So it's very easy, easy to go down the path when you are in a dysfunctional home. And I think it's just time if people did have, have it rough to kind of share it. I mean, men having a therapist is like, Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Not in my coach. world. Yeah. I, right. I, I, you know, yeah. it, mental health is so important. Look at the suicide rate, right? 
I mean, mental health is so important. We need to get a grip on it. It's taken over. And look at what we just went through for the last two years. Kids and their mental health. My three kids, they didn't go to school. They didn't see their, their classmates. Their college in high school. Um, my, my son was in college. My daughters were in high school. Like, they were miserable, but they were down and out about it. And adults didn't see their, they didn't see their co-workers and family or they got to see everybody on zoom and you know the big joke was the covid 15 where everybody gained 15 pounds because they were drinking a bottle of wine and eating junk food and binge watching tv that's how we dealt with covid and you know a lot of us really suffered um, through that so it's a it's important and i just don't think that there's enough awareness right now with men going through some some stuff no, I love what you're writing about. I love this, this even the the vulnerability opening up. I mean, you're certainly educated in that, that being your background, the master's in counseling. Yeah, I've been working on a, a book as well. It should be out early next year, but it definitely talks about some taboo things too, which is like restoring a relationship, you know, daddy issues, right? A lot of <laughs> boys have daddy issues. That's a big part of it as well is because I feel like that's the answer, right? The stuff that you went through and you actually wrote about and you're dealing with, like that's a part of like the healing that most people never really get because they never, they feel like if they don't talk about it or they just shove it back there, like it doesn't come with them. It's like, no, it actually comes with you everywhere and you actually just carry it with you everywhere and it pervades every aspect of your life until you take it off the shelf and go, I'm going to deal with it. Because as we all know, when we're not expecting things, if you don't want to deal with it, it's going to come off the shelf at some point in your life. And there's going to be some major catastrophe that happens because you didn't deal with something. And now, now's your time to deal with it. it fell off the shelf. I mean, I was incredibly angry. I had some nice success in, in business and my career in sales, but I was I was very angry and I brought tension around all the time. Um, I would bring my work home with me angry if it wasn't a great day. I would just bring tension around. And it took me 48, 49 years to figure this out. And so that's where this came from. And here I am, you know, just over 50 and I've never been happier because I've, I've let go of that angst and that tension um, that I carried, but I didn't know I was, I actually didn't know I was doing that because I was raised in a household that was just, you could cut the tension with a knife. And I always said I wanted to be opposite. Everything needs to be opposite of what I was accustomed to or what I witnessed or how I was brought up. Everything had to be opposite. But the one important, one of the most important things was that that tension. Nobody likes being around a tense dude. <laughs> it's not healthy. It needs to go. You know, my kids have seen it and my family and you got to work on it and make peace with your past. What was the turning point for you with all this? Like what, what was the catalyst? Cause there's usually some pain to kind of go through a lot of the pain that you went through. What was the turning point like for you where you were like, man, I got to start dealing with some of this. Yelling in the house and yelling in the house is something I grew up with and I, and I didn't like it. You know, I wasn't violent in the house, but I was yelling in the house. And I just thought that was okay. But it wasn't because it makes everybody feel uneasy. And in 2019, I listened to a lot of books. I listened to a lot of a lot of podcasts. I was listening to your your podcast over the weekend. You had some great shows that, that I just uh, listened to. And one of the books that I listened to in 2019 when I was training for the Boston Marathon was a book called I Don't Want to Talk About It by Terry Real, Man, Male Depression. He pioneered this taboo talk about male depression because Terry had wrote it 30 years prior. I think it's a 30 year old book and it's even hard to talk about it now, but he wrote about it 30 years ago. And I went to see him. Um, and he said, I, and when I said to Terry, I said, he wrote the story about his upbringing. And I said, Terry, that book reminds me of everything that I went through as a kid. I said, I was you as the kid and your dad was my dad. But I had it way worse than you did, Terry. And you know what he said to me? He said, you're fucked. You need to go down to Arizona, down to PCS, Psychological Counseling Services, and check in there for a couple of weeks. That was the first time I admit I had depression because I knew that I was masking my depression with my sports, my workaholism, my extreme athletics, you know, the marathons and later the Ironmans and some things like that. I went down there and when I was working on what my traumas were was caring for a loved one that was really sick. It was my fiance at the time. She was very sick for a couple of years, deathbed sick. One was lost her a couple of times. And they said, mm -mm, 
that's great that you took care of her. And yes, that's traumatic. But your trauma, I'm like, what are you talking about? There's not really any trauma. I said, your childhood. And so when I tell stories about like some of the things that I remembered about the, the belittlement or the beatdowns or, or how things shaped me growing up, they were like, you tell that about a kid that you don't feel bad for. And I was like, well, it was me. Well, I don't need to feel bad for me. And, but yet, Peter, if you told me about your son, that he was put through a wall at six or seven years old, and then he had to fix the wall, and his sister thought he was dead, I would be like, oh my God, it would almost bring me to tears, right? Or, you know, he, you know, beat down submissions or, you know, just, just poked, just shaming. And I never told that with empathy. I told it as just like, hey, this is that kid. And I was that kid. So it was like, I was a stoic. But if I told that about somebody else, I want to, I want to. There was a dissociation between you and your own feelings that you had during that time. And if you were to think about the exact same story for anybody else, I mean, you'd be in tears and an empathetic yeah. mess for the other individual who had went through it. But yet here you were at PCS, they're telling you like, Bill, listen to who you're talking about. Where did that kind of crack for you? What happened with that? And what was that? How was the shell opened? Two things happen. So when you're in an intensive, right? They have a meeting with all the clinicians and doctors and therapists. And there's a meeting of like 20 of them. They invite you to the meeting and they just talk about you. And so really where, where, really where my eyes opened and, and I was like, wow, this is kind of major is two of my favorite clinicians I spent a lot of time with they were talking back and forth and they're crying while they're telling some of the stories that I shared with them. And I was like, whoa, who are they talking about? It's me. I was just like, I felt bad that they felt bad, but I still didn't feel bad for the kid. You follow? Yeah, that's the biggest dissociation ever, right? I mean, totally. I, I get where you're at. Yeah. It took lots of work with great people to, to figure that out. And now the self, the self care, the self love, this everything takes takes care of itself, you know, with um, identifying that. But man, that that did take some work. The second eye opener there, aha moment, epiphany. There's this test called the ACE test. Have you heard of the ACE test? Yes, the adverse childhood experiences. Yes, test. You take the ACE test, and it's about your. So the adverse childhood experiences about different types of abuse. So I take this test, and I connected with the doctor that worked with me on the test. And he, he looks at me and he says, you should be dead or in jail based statistically based on what you scored on this test. Statistically, you should be dead or in jail because that's what people that have gone through what you've gone through, where you're at. And then so what we uncovered there was like, I've misstepped a lot. I could be dead or in jail because I did a lot of stupid, stupid things that could have taken me down the wrong path. I got lucky in some sense, but I lost myself in my work. I lost myself in my sports or my workouts. And I just did those to extreme. So it was the lesser of all the evils, but yet it was still detrimental in, in some capacity to work so hard, get so amped up, and then take that stress home, literally take it home into the house. I couldn't put that away and leave that at the door. I want to run something by you and see see how you connect with this too. I was talking with some friends the other day and I have a really good friend who owns a, a drug and alcohol and disorders recovery center here in Scottsdale. I remember our, one of our conversations, it just really sat with me. He said, drug addiction, he said, alcoholism, workaholism, all these addictions people have, phones, pornography, whatever it is. He said it's all comes back to essentially being spiritually bankrupt in a way mm -hmm. where you're not trusting God's got you. And essentially you're trying to force things to happen. And some of this is, you know, from a kid, like you didn't, you didn't know how to deal with it. This was just, this was actually a helpful mechanism for you to get by, right? Until it wasn't helpful anymore. Right. You know, like you said, you weren't abusing drugs, you weren't drinking, you know, you weren't running around with other ladies and stuff on your on your wife, whatever else, like all these other right. things you could have been doing. And in fact, it looks good, right? It's a responsible thing to do is to be an overachiever and to be a workaholic. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just what's inside or what were you avoiding, right? In that it's like, I mean, I look at your, I still, I still congratulate you on all the successes that you've had because you've done so much. And I do want you to talk about some of that, but I do think it's so, it's amazing to see what you came through and where you're at right now. 
Did you have a faith at that time in your life when you were undergoing all this rapid transformation? Yes, I have. And so early on, I talked to you about getting out of the house any way I could, right? So that was sports, paper routes. I had like three paper routes. And but here was the, the, the one that was at a younger age was my friends were, I used to tag along with them and go to church, not because I wanted to go to church and not because I really understood the God thing that much. I did. I went with my grandparents, but it was to get out of the house. And then I became an altar boy to get out of the house. And then I would do multiple masses to get out of the house. Then when I was in school and there was funerals, I could get out of school to go do a funeral. Like it was really kind of strange. And then I would do weddings so I could get money as an altar boy. Like I was always trying to understand that I just didn't really connect as much as I wanted to. And I spent time with, with the priest talking about it. I just really didn't connect on a high level, but it set the base of spiritual spirituality for me uh, as a kid. And now I'm incredibly spiritual. And now, you know, I, I mean, my, my faith is very important. I read the Bible every day. Every single day, I'll read a daily Bible. It's a Bible with daily devotionals. I do my, my online church service, and it's part of my routine. And it's part of building that fortress of stuff that can happen to you during any given day to prepare yourself so I don't get angry, so I don't melt down, so I, I, I can continue to operate at a high level when stuff comes at you. And so spirituality and faith is very important in that realm. Yeah, I feel like the spiritual bankruptcy, that term, you know, it's like you did, you had that, you had that foundation, right? You had that, you were doing all those things within the church to get out and get away. And it was an easy access for you to come back because it was a familiar place. And so then for you, the the bar wasn't so high for you to go in and go, okay, like I, here I am. I, I do now. I want to, I want to seek something a little bit more for myself. This is a little bit more personal to me now. So yeah, I, I just, I find that so fascinating. And I, and I find that the, the compensatory behavior, whether it's with whether it's with something that society deems harmful or even sometimes good, right? It can swing a lot of different ways, but it does come down to what's in our heart. So this happened. This was 2019, right? Yeah. Take us up to where you are right now. It's 2022. And uh, you kind of walk us forward with all the different revelations you've had or the things that have happened for you since those revelations that you've had. Wow. Uh, so I'm way calmer. I do have a lot more compassion for that kid being me that I didn't have before. Beautiful. I still do a lot of my extreme sports and the Ironmans and the and the martial arts. And but but here's the thing: when I, when I do those, I get some of my best ideas, and I always have those endorphins are just incredibly creative. And the things that you can get from from that good high when those endorphins kick in. I mean. All my journal notes, all a lot of things that ended up, you know, that I wrote about were as a result of a three-hour run because the ideas and the thoughts and the energy is just so clean and so wholesome and it's just, it's so productive. And so I continue to do that. I feel like I've, I'm at one of the best places that I've been with with my children and our relationships as now they're, they're getting older. I got two in college and one graduating next year, high school. And so... You know, I want them to have it way better than I've ever had. And that was always my goal for them, even though I've misstepped, you know, along the way with my kids. I'm very quick to forgive and not hold a grudge. We started talking, you know, just some of the issues that, that I had growing up. There's no ill will. There's no ill will. As a matter of fact, a lot of life lessons are from doing the opposite of what I learned. What I've liked it to be nurture, <laughs> a little bit more nurturing and loving and unconditional, sure. But I learned so many things not to do because that's how I knew I didn't want it for anyone else. Working on the legacy piece because I want to be a shining light and a superhero to my kids as they see me, as they grow up. And I want to model for them to make an impact. So we do a lot of, you know, we'll do some char charitable events together. We'll do some things that I would just do quietly before. Now I do it with them so they can see it. And one of the things that happens, in 2000, well, it was last year in 2021, we do a lot of work with Make-A-Wish and a lot of fundraising. And part of my business in the mortgage business is we give some proceeds back to Make-A-Wish. We've been doing that since 2006. And part of that, and you, so we talk about lessons, part of that was because I grew up where, you know, being cheap 
was modeled. Because if you gave a dollar, you were less a dollar. When you give someone a dollar, it's going to come back to you tenfold if you do it with good intentions and for the greater good. It's like tithing. It'll just come, it'll come back to you. So I was training for Make-A-Wish, the Boston Marathon, and this was what, 2021? It was 2021. And it, they were doing it in October because they canceled because of COVID in April when they usually normally do it in Boston. And so it was August. And I'm coming down the stairs carelessly. I think I was texting my daughter. It was like five in the morning. She was going to get a, a dental procedure and I was texting her good luck or something. And, and it was dark and I, I missed the two bottom steps. When I landed, I, this is not sexy, but when I landed, I tore my quad. So not in dramatic fashion, like I was paragliding or anything like that. I, I tore my quad all the, all the way up to my hip, basically missing two bottom steps. And make a wish in the Boston Marathon. And everybody was like, hey, sorry to hear what happened. I went to surgery the next day. They had to, they had to pull it down. And it was the most pain I ever had. They said, we'll try to get your entry fee for next year. And you can run for make a wish next year. And I said, well, wait a second. No, no, no. We can do this thing. We're going to do it on crutches, right? Because 60 days is not enough time to heal a two-year injury. <laughs> still dealing with it. <laughs> and, and they're like, no, no, you can't. You, and then so they're like, it sounds like a great so then, idea. Yeah, right. It sounds like a great idea. I think, I think some of those meds were kicking in and the Boston Marathon said, absolutely not. We reached out, make a wish, said, sorry again. And, and I, and I said, no, we're going to do this. We're going to figure this out. And I was working with someone at PCS at the time. And she's like, what do you have to prove? You're just going to injure yourself some more. And I was like, listen. I've gotten to know some of these kids at Make-A-Wish that we grant these wishes for. I've gotten to understand their mission. When they're dealt their critical illness, they don't have a choice on what they can do or not do. So what's a few hours of pain for me in training to go do something where I can raise a little bit of awareness and maybe bring in some more funds than I would have? And that was my why. And and I... Uh, I wanted to, I wanted my kids to know that when you commit to something, and now if they break anything, I don't need them to go prove a point, but I want them to feel that when they commit to something that's really important to them, that they can fulfill that commitment. It ended up the silver lining with the with the torn quad ended up being we raised probably four times the amount, amount of money that I would have raised. Uh, got a lot of news coverage. Uh, we did the marathon on crutches at my local college where. They they had us do it um, at the state college, and that was my um, alma mater. And I have I have scho- I do scholarships as part of the give back thing, right? So we do scholarships for them. And they said absolutely. Well, you, they gave me the football field and track to go set up and and do this virtual Boston Marathon uh, with Make a Wish. And my kids were there, and there was there was so many supporters, and it was just part of knowing that. This is going to impact a lot of people and bring this incredible awareness and set an example. And it's the next chapter of the legacy, right? That's right. We want to leave that legacy. And maybe it's important or maybe it's not. But, you know, what I said to my dad when I confronted him after getting out of PCS was I said, Dad, if you don't do anything differently with your life, your tombstone's just going to have your name and the date you lived. And that's it. What kind of legacy is that? If that doesn't set the wheels in motion, then nothing will. You talked about legacy and I think modeling for your children, what, you know, being a positive role model, because face it, how we learn to become is through our parents and our interactions with our parents, right? I mean, you're, you're growing young adults, really. And so by modeling for them, what you were doing with make a wish and, and like you talked about, putting up with hard things because they're meaningful, discovering your why. And now you're teaching them other things like do things because it elevates you. You know, like your runs, like they're no longer an escape from your feelings or from stuff you didn't want to bring up. It's like to elevate your, con- like to, to feel great. Like you do Krav Maga. I mean, you're a black belt in Krav Maga and you've got all these different things that you love to do. You're very physically fit and these are just to elevate your life. What a beautiful gift that you're giving to your kids by sharing this experience with them. Because, you know, like they say, if you can change one person's life, I mean, that's huge. I mean, think these kids that you're make a wish, you know, giving to, they may, 
they're going to probably going to get to go on their vacation and do, you know, do the thing that they really want to do. And it's a very, very, very meaningful thing. But then look at your kids and these kids are going to be around you, you know, hopefully for the rest of your life, you know, and they're going to be able to meet the world at a different level just by watching the way that you interacted with the world and change some things and change the script that you were running. What a big deal for your children. Yeah, but they still won't text me all the time when I reach out to them or, you know, I mean, we had a family weekend down in University of Rhode Island when my daughter was going for homecoming and I took some family photos and I got in big trouble and threatened that they won't spend any time with me anymore if I post pictures. <laughs> so, so I continue <laughs> to miss that. I continue to miss that. Well, you know what? You're teaching them boundaries and they can they can also practice boundaries with you. I think sometimes in a home where a parent is a little bit ruthless and doesn't really respect boundaries, the kids don't learn great boundary setting either. So what you're modeling now is, hey, you can tell me what you think and what you want. And it's all a part of the learning journey, right? It's happening for them, not to them. So this is, I love that saying how things are happening for you, not to you, you know? Why don't you talk a little bit about what you're up to these days? You've got Thriving in the Storm, Nine Principles to Help You Overcome Any Adversity. Definitely going to be a link uh, in the show notes for people to be able to order that. That's on pre-order right now, right? Oh, no, that, that, that was out? released uh, a couple weeks ago. Okay, awesome. Oh, congratulations. It's a big Thank deal. You. So why don't you tell a, a few things that, you, that you're up to right now? What do you have going on? We're having some fun with the book and we're doing some, we're hopefully releasing some coursework. I'm excited. I'm excited. I, I put it out there on paper. I never thought I would ever be vulnerable. I was the first one to say, you know, that dude's crying. He's soft. And I probably had a choice word, you know, back in the day. So come a long way there in sharing. I don't care what my friends think that, you know, I sold out, right? Because I want to help people, right? And I think when we when we talk about this, I, I want it just to be impactful. And if it can help people overcome some stuff, look deep down and maybe identify with that kid that they don't feel bad for that was abused in some way and connect. Now it's going to take a lot more than looking in the mirror one time, but if it can get the wheels turning so where they can work on themselves with whether that's therapy, whether that's an intensive, whether that's, you know, their routines of journaling or meditation or prayer or uh, you know, however spiritually they get. That's what I want to do. And so there were some principles in there that cover a couple of things. It was you're capable of, everybody is capable of way more than they think, no matter how much you have been made to feel less than. And even if you are a super achiever, you're capable of way more than you think you are. I see some of the most talented athletes and even in my, in, in my business and sales that were just super, 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 super talented. And yet they didn't live to their potential. Not that they didn't think they were capable of, but they may have been complacent and they didn't want to push. And then you see the others where, you know, not as talented, but they surpass the super talented because it, there's always more that you can do in any area of life. There's more than you can do. So that was one. You're capable of way more than you think you are. 10 exit, 20 exit. I don't care. You're capable of way more. And the other part of that is when you're down and out and that adversity does strike, it could be a major challenge or it could be a minor challenge. But instead of staying down and being sad or being playing the victim or being down and out or depressed or angry or hostile or revengeful, you can thrive. But a lot of people don't even go to thrive. They'll say, you know what? I'm not going to play the victim. However, I'm just surviving. So I'm going to let it pass. I'm not going to do much because this is really terrible what just happened to me, but I'm going to get through it and just survive, which is great. Well, how about accelerating that survival mode to thrive? And that's what this is about. So if you take those levels of emotions that you had, the despair and the sadness and the angst and the anxiety and depression or whatever, and hostility, and you start to put those in feelings of joy, happiness, gratitude, so thankful, love, love for life, incredibly motivated, right? So now you can start to create, even though you still have that adversity, you can create and accomplish things way faster than you would have if you stayed down and out. Totally. Yeah. You're just kind of trans, you know, uh, I guess you could say, what's the word? Almost transforming those words into something different. 
you know, it's almost like the butterfly coming from the caterpillar yeah. kind of a deal, you know, where it's you're you're changing it into something else because it's energy, right? If it's either negative energy or it's positive energy, it's energy and it really can come one can go to the other. So you it's pretty easy to swing back and forth if you're not conscious of where you're going with it and what you're doing. It's neat because it's fun. Like I look at life right now and I'm like, you get to a certain spot and you feel like, okay, like I've done these certain things. And it's so fun is that life is just a continuous journey. It's going to be really neat to watch you on your journey now with Thriving in the Storm with the book. This is the very beginning of the next part of your journey. And that's what I love about it too, is because the people you're going to impact, the connections you're going to make, the thing, the people that you're going to be able to help and the people who are going to actually impact your life. I just think about that and I'm like, this is, Bill's really got it coming. This is going to be really, really good because I think life has culminated in an experience where you get to write a book. You got the book out there. You're like, and a lot of people like, you did it. You wrote a book. And you're like, oh, it's just beginning. Like, because you've put yourself out there, you became vulnerable, right? This is the whole piece was becoming vulnerable and just showing other people that they can also achieve and transcend their suffering by being vulnerable and opening up and having good connections and by, by working forward and thriving against adversity. But now you've done this for all these people. Now, where do these people go, right? So now you've got, like you said, there's possibly coursework coming out. I see speaking engagements here. I mean, I see different things for you. And I see a lot of people coming up to you saying, hey, Bill, you're like me. And your dad was like my dad. <laughs> it's absolutely, absolutely so, right. Because your story is super unique in and of itself. It's unique and it's not, right? Because your your story about your growing up is like many other sure. children right? How as horrific as it was in all of the different ways. But that's what's so cool is that your special superpower is being able to connect with other people on that deep and intimate level, just letting them know like, hey, it's this is who I am. And you're allowing other people to see that that's possible for them too. Absolutely. One of the things I struggled with is, hey, people had it way harder than me. And what I learned was I can't compare. I'm not going to compare who had it worse and who didn't have it worse. And what feats were better than other feats that were accomplished. It's everybody has their story, right? And if you can help just one other person with your story, and however that comes out, if you want to write an article, if you want to put it on a book, if you want to go on your podcast, you know, you want to tell your story, then tell your story if you can help somebody, how you overcame some tough stuff. So I think that matters. We all have a book in us, right? Yours is coming out. I think everyone does. And that's one of the things I actually ask a lot of guests. I don't get a lot of people on who've written books. You have. And one of the things I'll often ask people about their story as they're, you know, at the end, maybe we're off air or whatever. I'm like, so uh, when's the book coming out? You know, and it's kind of one of the things is that everyone's got a book in them. You could have a hundred people saying a similar message. They're all going to say it in their own way. And it's going to touch very specifically different people, right? How many times have you heard a specific message and it never touched you until that one person said it in the specific way that they said it? And it's like, it just was like a key in a lock. It's like, my goodness, I never, I never heard that message before. And it's like, oh, you actually did, but you were the guy for the message. Yeah. And um, so, Bill, I can't thank you enough. Your story is so cool. Where you are right now and what you're doing with your story is really neat. And thank you for writing your book. Um, you know, it's a gift to humanity, the fact that you've done that. And I think that that's, it's one of your biggest things. I know you've raised over half a million dollars for Make-A-Wish and you've all done all these different things over your life, all these very, very incredible charitable contributions and whatever. But one of the biggest contributions that I believe that you're going to make is this book that you wrote and the people that you're going to touch with it and the people that you're going to be able to connect with because of it. I'm excited for your journey and I plan on staying in touch with you. Oh, I appreciate it. I really appreciate you having me on. One last thought with everyone and what they went through the past couple of years or whatever, and what's your message for people on getting life back together going after these last few years of COVID sitting on their haunches? The quickest and easiest way to just write your ship, no matter how dire it is or, or how seemingly good things are, is just make sure you give gratitude every single day for the little things that your health, your kids' health, your family, you know, just your job, you know, whatever it is, the roof over your head, most of the things that we can be grateful for are free in life. And that's what I would start. I love it. Well, thanks so much, Bill. You're a very inspiring 
person. And I've just really enjoyed having you on the podcast. I'm looking forward to sharing this far and wide. As far as you and I, we will be in touch. I look forward to getting to the end of your book. I loved one thing I have to note is you have these little action items that people can do, you know, in the chapters. And I thought that was really cool. It's like, instead of just reading a story, there's a few things that you can do yourself, like apply this to your life. So I'm looking forward to completing all your little action items in the book as well. So that's not fluff either. I mean, that, that's stuff that I, that I do or kind of grabbed from all kinds of different things over the years and applied. I hope all goes well. You know, happy autumn. We've got all the holidays coming up and, you know, so. Yeah. Thank you, you the too. Best of the autumn season. You too. Thank you. Wasn't that a great podcast? I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did, man. Having that conversation with Bill and getting to know him, just awesome. I really wanted to share some show notes for you guys, uh, some links. Go to his book's website, thrivinginthestorm.com. Pick up your copy there, or you can get it on Amazon. Do something like that. Even on his website, you know, thrivinginthestorm.com, you can get some different things on that website at no cost to you just to kind of give you some more information on there. But the book is awesome and I hope you guys really enjoy it and take something away from it. Hope you guys really enjoyed the story too. There's something that a lot of these guests have, right? No surprise, it's in every one of you that you can overcome adversity. And that's what Bill's message is to all of us today. And this is what a lot of these guests in the podcast have had that I hope you guys can get out of it too and kind of see where in your life, maybe you're like fighting hard and you're pushing really hard against something instead of just really seeing, oh my goodness, like this might be the answer. This struggle that is like right here, right now, this might actually be the answer to me actually living the life that I really want. So if you guys are enjoying the podcast, please leave it a rating and a review. Really love that from you guys. Um, It helps the show out a ton share it with a friend, the friends who you share your successes with and the ones where you can share a cool podcast or a video and say, hey, this you might like this. Let's get Bill out there to the world. Let's help him change some lives. All right, guys, we'll see you back next time for episode 83 of the Rise Again podcast. Hey, thanks for listening to the Rise Again podcast. Great episode, hey? You know what? I really love interviewing people and I love getting people on who have things to share with the world. So if you have a really cool guest that you'd like to get on the podcast, email me and I will do my best to get them on the show. I hope you guys have a phenomenal week and stay tuned for the next episode of the Rise Again podcast.